Thank you. They play classical music brilliantly, but they don't take themselves too seriously. That's the beauty and the charm of the Quartetto Gelato and why I've been a huge fan of the Ice Cream Quartet ever since they were formed in 94. And they are Cynthia Stelias, oboe, Joseph Massarello, accordion, George Meanwell, cello, guitar, mandolin, and Peter DeSoto. Tenor, violin, mandolin. Thank you very much. That was the Italian tango, Tango del Mare, and we are the Toronto-based Quartetto Gelato. Now, Quartetto Gelato can be translated in many ways. It's a multiplayer environment. It's a, a group that appears before you this afternoon pro bono. <laughs> it's uh, an Italian, a half an Italian, someone married to an Italian, and myself, who would very much like to be an Italian. <laughs> except since last Tuesday I've been wearing these very beautiful Korean trousers. <laughs> we began playing for our own amazement in a restaurant north of Toronto, playing music and instruments that we weren't getting to play during our respectable day jobs. And we began playing for people who had menus in front of them rather than programs, so it was natural for us to speak in between the pieces that we were playing, both to let the audience know a little bit about what we were doing and also to let the other members of the band know what was coming next. <laughs> Since then, we've traveled all over the world. I've worn these particularly attractive shoes this afternoon because they have walked across the Piazza del Duomo in Milan, the park in Greenwich in London, shrines in Kamakura and Nara in Japan, the rainforest in darkest Borneo, Victoria Peak in Hong Kong, and the church in Cochin, China, or Cochin, India, rather, where Vasco da Gama was buried. We'd like to continue now with a piece, a bagatelle, or a trifle, more dessert jokes, the whole thing is sort of, <laughs> whole thing is sort of spoon in cheek. Um, 
written by Dvorak. You may be familiar with the endless and fervent speculation that goes on about what Bach would have thought of the modern piano. Well, we like to think that in this first bagatelle, we broaden the field of speculation to what Dvorak would have thought of the accordion. Before I speak about classical music, I have to say that as a daughter of two research scientists, I have learned something from Idea City that I can guarantee no one else has learned. It's been quite an awakening, and it is a reaction to the, all the scientists that who, who have, I always say perform, but who have spoken, who have presented in the past two days, that I have been struck by how, not that they're harbingers of doom and gloom, but in fact, how charming and engaging and, in fact, essentially so incredibly normal they have been. <laughs> My question is, do people like classical music? Well, obviously, from the reaction and the well-deserved reaction that Adrian received yesterday from his wonderful performance, people do love classical music. But then we're reading, it seems far too frequently, about struggling orchestras across North America. And even one as wonderful as the Toronto Symphony and as wonderful as, as a city as Toronto. And so it reminds me of a story that a, a conductor told me recently. His orchestra does outreach programs into the schools. And um, when he goes to the schools, he asks the kids, how many of you hate opera? Everyone puts up his hand. And he asks another question. How many of you have ever heard opera? No one puts up his hand. <laughs> We're really getting a bad rap here. <laughs> but then you think about the great superstars of classical music, the people like Yo-Yo Ma or Luciano Pavarotti or James Galway or Itzhak Perlman and so on. And they are superstars probably in a way that there have never been superstars in classical music until this, this time. Financially, they do very well, as I understand. And uh, they're certainly very well known. And now, why is that? Well, I suppose they've become personalities. And we do like celebrities these days. But 
when it comes to their playing, each one of the people that I have named, if you're a classical music listener at all, they're very easy to recognize. Whenever I hear a flutist, I can tell right away whether it's Galway or not. And when I hear an aria, whether it's Verdi or Puccini or Mozart, I can always tell if it's, if it's Pavarotti. Even for the non-classical listener, they all know that the three tenors are Pavarotti, Domingo, and the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we can say that people don't know about classical music, but then we hear these stories, like about you know, the Toronto Symphony having its trouble this year, which I hope, and I, and I truly believe the trouble is over and they're on their way back again. But we often get people coming up to us and saying, well, I, I really loved the concert, and, and, and I really loved the Mozart that you played, but you know, I'm really not in a position to judge. Well, what other facet of life, and certainly of entertainment, can you imagine saying that? Of course you're in a position to judge. Did you like it or not? No, I didn't like it. Yes, I did. We've already had reactions to uh, Douglas Copeland's <laughs> art exhibit made up here. Either people like it or they don't. The wonderful thing about the arts, and I think this is the essence of true great art, is that it can be enjoyed on so many levels. It can be enjoyed as, oh, it makes me relax when I listen to classical music after a hard day. Or it means that, you know, I never noticed this in that particular piece before. Or this artist brought something different to that so that I can enjoy it in a different way. When we when I talk about all these different things, of course, I'm not coming to any conclusions, and any of the other classical musicians, including my colleagues on stage, could probably you know, shoot arrows through all of the things that I'm saying and say, yes, but, and that's true, of course. It's not a definitive thing. It's not science. And, but the one thing that, that disturbs me about the training, and certainly the training that I went through as a musician going to uh, conservatories and to music faculties, is that <coughs> we're told that we're a vehicle to communicate Beethoven's music, Mozart's music. That it's not, it's not about my fame, it's about Beethoven's fame. It's about Dvorak's fame there. It wasn't that you're supposed to like us, you're supposed to like Dvorak. Well, you know, Dvorak's already got all his great reviews. And so, <laughs> and plus, so that means that if you've heard the definitive performance of Dvorak, then you don't want to hear another one. So it comes back to that thing, well, what about Pavarotti, you know? People may say, oh, everything sounds the same, but he does bring his character to Puccini, to Verdi, and I think that's, that there's a lot of credit to that. You want to know the character of the performer, just like you know in pop music who it is and, and the personality behind it. Um, having said that, we don't actually call ourselves a classical ensemble. We call ourselves classical crossover. And rather tr than trying to describe what classical crossover means, uh, I think we're better if we demonstrate through our music. So we would like to play another piece. I, could, uh, I think Joe once called this the uh, UN, piece for the UN. It's called Dark Eyes in English, Occhi Neri in Italian, and Occiccionia in Russian. And this features our accordionist, Joseph Matrolo.
Thank you very much. The only thing I would add to what Cynthia is saying is that we speak of experiencing music with an almost physical pleasure. And I and I know the rest of my colleagues feel very fortunate that we have a life in which we can produce, that we double that pressure, pleasure because we're actually producing the music physically with these old acoustic instruments. And I'm reminded of what Ronnie Burkett said yesterday about the voice in the theater, that there is something fundamentally amazing, and this ties again into science, that these simple objects vibrating can do so much in the world. We'd like to close with asking Peter to sing a Neapolitan song, Rondine al Nido, which the singer sings of the swallows who return faithfully every year, but again of his beloved who has flown away never to return. This is Rondine al Nido. I've persuaded them, an encore.